Hey everybody, welcome to Book Invasion. My name is Scott. I hope you're doing well. Today we're going to talk about Rosewater by Todd A. Thompson. Rosewater is book one of the Wormwood trilogy. Uh, Todd A. had also written a previous book called The Murders of Molly the Southbourne, which I haven't read but it looks pretty cool. And he's also done some other um, book releases as well. I had seen a lot of buzz about this book. It was nominated for a Goodreads Choice Awards for sci-fi. Um, in 2018, I believe, but I hadn't seen many reviews about it, so I decided to give it a try. And this one was definitely, uh, it was definitely odd. It was, I felt it was kind of like, um, like the Matrix mixed with, like, Contact. Let me tell you what this book is about. So Rosewater is the name of a town that's built around this sphere, or this dome, biodome, I guess you can call it. And the biodome is some type of an alien um, technology or, or an alien life form or an alien spaceship. We're, we're not really sure. All we know is that every once a year the dome opens and everyone that's in a certain vicinity of the dome has all of their ailments healed. Broken bones, like cancer, things like that. But sometimes that healing can go wrong where in instances that it can actually raise the dead, or appendages can pop out of people, um, and sometimes those things aren't always the best. So, there's a pilgrimage to this dome. When it opens, people kind of have a party, they go crazy, they build a city around this dome, and that's what then had become Rosewater. And so with this arrival, this biodome, there have been these xenoforms released into the earth and these xenoforms are just microscopic beings that can that can connect to human nerve endings and there are certain people um, that are called sensitives who can tap into these xenoforms and then can reach out to the xenosphere and can kind of tap into people's minds here and there they can also use the xenoforms in the xenosphere to kind of call out to other sensitives and they use that kind of as a power to inject visions in the, of people's minds who may not, that are not sensitive. They can use that to project into people's minds different kind of things, horrible things, or just, just freaky things. And so the book follows the, the events of Caro. Caro is a sensitive. He was initially kind of a, a misfit, a thief, um, and then by ways of these the Xenosphere and him being able to kind of find things, he was eventually recruited to a secret government agency called S-45. And he's kind of the anti-hero. He's kind of unlikable. He's, he's a jerk. He doesn't really want to work for the government. Um, he's kind of just the unlikable hero. He's arrogant. He's kind of sexist. And in the book, you, you get it from his perspective a lot. He talks about the beautiful women and their physical appearance, and there's definitely mentions of explicit sex here, and, and but uh, there's also him on his quest of just like, I don't care, I'm, I may be the best sensitive that these people know, I'm, best, I'm the best at what I do, but I don't really give a shit about what you guys want me to do. But then other sensitives and his friends from his government agency start to die. And so he sent on this spiraling quest to kind of figure out why, what's happening, and why these people are dying. Um, he recruits some of his friends, and he alienates some of his friends. And then we eventually learn some other details about Kauro, um, about how the origins of the sphere came to be, and what his role in that was, and why he has these certain powers. And the story develops really well. Um, the pacing of the plot is definitely, it, it keeps it up to scale a lot. There are certain times where it had me scratch my head, like, what what's going on? They're in the Xenosphere, um, somebody turns into a, a griffin, and something else happens. And so some of those things were kind of odd. The story also follows an alternating timeline, is where each chapter starts with a date, 2066 is now, and 2040, and 2050 is then. And yeah, the book is more of a futuristic sci-fi noir alien contact it's a bit cerebral but yet it's a lot it's very accessible to it's not very 
high sci-fi, I suppose. It's, it's just kind of, you just understand that the xenosphere is there, and these xenoforms can kind of reach out. Um, but that's as far as it goes uh, with sci-fi technology, I suppose you would say. So it's pretty easy to understand and follow. Just the, uh, the visualization and, and the imagination that uh, the author has when writing this, it kind of goes a little step above and beyond what you typically would see just in a generic sci-fi. It's, it's very out there. It, it's more of like a, like a Philip K. Dick kind of story where things start going haywire really fast and it's like an acid trip almost. So I'll give you some, uh, some likes and dislikes. So I really like the concept of, of Rosewater, the village, and the biodome, and the xenosphere. That whole concept and the way that was played out was really well done. I like kind of the thought that this dome, nobody's really seen inside of it, but yet it opens, and when it opens, people are healed. Um, rather than like aliens are trying to take over the earth, it's a mysterious kind of thing where we're not sure why it's giving these healing powers and healing people's ailments. That kind of mystery was, was kind of intriguing to me, and it kept the book um, kind of moving. Um, I also kind of like the alternating timelines. Um, it, it kind of picks, cherry picks the different points in the history of Caro and, and where his experience in the past led to his experience now, so there would be something going on. And there's also within the chapters that are not flashbacks, there's called like side missions, and those are kind of like mini flashbacks, but they're not dedicated to a whole chapter, it's just kind of like a, a side detail. Um, I also kind of like Caro, where he doesn't want to be a hero, he's just kind of a, a, an asshole and that kind of made him unlikable, but also made him intriguing. Like, you don't really know. He's not always for the same plan as everyone else. And you kind of want to know what he's going to get up to, how he's going to get to break the rules. And it's not always cut and dry that he's always going to be the guy like, Oh, follow me, we'll do it. He's just kind of like, maybe I'll do it, maybe I won't. So I thought that was kind of more intriguing. It pulls you into the story a lot more. And for my dislikes that I had... Um, there were some explicit sex scenes in here, which I'm not, you know, I'm not against, but it was, it seemed kind of out of place where you're just like, you're taking it back a little bit and you're like, uh, I'm a little bit uncomfortable, I don't know what the purpose of this, of this is. Um, so it was kind of weird, but, you know, it, it lends to the imagination of the story. Um, it also lends to some uh, criticisms about the sexism and, and that the author just wants to talk about how beautiful the women's breasts are and all this kind of stuff, but... You know, in the realm of the whole story, it's there, I think, and it has some type of purpose just to elevate the story and to elevate these experiences that you can happen in, in a Xenosphere, but it it seemed like maybe if those weren't there, you would have still gotten the same feel. Um, there were a lot of intertwining characters, and maybe this was just me because I listened to the audiobook, and I don't have a character's name like on a page to relate them to, you know, who they are, and I just kind of hear it, and I kind of got lost with who, who was that again, and I wasn't really sure what person's role was within the whole scheme. Like, and there were four or five, like, main characters, but then it branches off into these other ones. Um, the, the bicycle girl and what her role was got, kind of got confusing to me a little bit. Um, the other small complaint that I have was that the, the because I listened to the audiobook, the audiobook narrator is of African descent, maybe he's from Nigeria, so his accents, you know, he had a strong African Nigerian accent throughout the whole thing, and it was fine, but it made it hard to follow, like, on two times speed, you know, I had to slow it down a little bit to kind of catch the nuances, um, but I feel like if I hadn't done the audiobook and I had just read it on paper, I would have had a different kind of snarkier, humorous voice, um, and would have liked the book a little bit more probably on the page than would, what I got from the audiobook. Because I feel like the tone of his wasn't really, you know, accented or snarky or, or, you know, the jokes and things like that weren't portrayed as well as, you know, I had hoped that they were. But the narration of it was really good and obviously it lends to more authenticity when it's done by, uh, you know, an African narrator. And I think the second book is done by the same person too. So, I mean, I'll follow the audiobooks and I'll keep reading them. Uh, listening to them on audio. It was good, but the only gripe that I have was that usually I listen to it a little bit faster, but on this one the accent was a little bit too much for me to listen to on a higher speed, so I had to kind of slow it down a couple times. So yeah, I would recommend that you check this book out. It's definitely um, a new voice. It's definitely different. 
Um, I would maybe not recommend you check it out on audio, um, but read the book. I, I enjoyed it. Uh, book two is coming out soon, R Rosewater Insurrection. So I hope I'll have a review up for that for you as well. So that's my review on Rosewater. I hope you check it out. I hope you like it. Um, like and subscribe and all that jazz. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.